Although the date, 1453, is forever etched into the annals of military history as the year in which Constantinople fell to Ottoman Sultan Mehmet, on the opposite side of the European continent, another, if not equally important, still decisive event was taking place, the final stage of the Hundred Years' War. Here, in Goscony, an English army commanded by Sir John Talbot marched to the relief of the town of Castillon, determined to hold on to remaining English territories in France at all cost. The outcome of one of the medieval era's defining conflicts would soon be decided. The Hundred Years' War was a long, tumultuous, and exceedingly complex affair which cannot be recounted in any detail here. Suffice to say, the English had dominated much of France during the early 15th century. The combination of longbowmen with dismounted men-at-arms and other infantry proved decisive at places such as Agincourt and Vernouy, where they had triumphed over French arms. Indeed, in 1420, Henry V of England even declared himself heir to the Kingdom of France, seemingly cementing English victory and an end to the long and bloody conflict. Both Henry and the mentally feeble King of France, Charles VI, died two years later. The crown then passed Henry's young son, also named Henry, who would have ruled both countries in personal union, something which was hardly uncommon at the time. However, the situation was far more complicated, as despite their previous success, the English and their Burgundian allies were overstretched and unable to sustain firm control over all France. Furthermore, an English attempt to seize Orléans was repulsed in 1429 when the Dauphin, Charles VII, rallied resistance, in part with the help of a teenage peasant girl, Joan of Arc, and declared himself to be the true king. The situation got worse for the English in 1435, when the skilled regent for Henry, John of Redford, died. Perhaps even more important, the Duke of Burgundy changed sides and joined the French, which freed Charles's armies to concentrate solely against them. Paris was recaptured, and in the following years, other English strongholds in France fell in rapid succession until a treaty was signed in 1444, leaving the English with vastly reduced territory. The conflict broke out again when some English nobles refused to go along with handing Maine over to the French. Though the garrison eventually saw the writing on the wall and withdrew, soon after an English raiding party sacked the town in Brittany and hostilities officially erupted once more. The French marched into Normandy with a large army, attacking from multiple directions. Against such a formidable foe, there was little the English could do, and their garrison submitted quickly, often with little to no resistance. Eventually, a relief force commanded by Thomas Curiel was scraped together to prevent the situation from collapsing completely, and defend the now vastly reduced English-held territory in Normandy. Soon after its arrival across the Channel, though, Curiel's army was intercepted and decisively defeated by French forces at Formigny, with only a handful of English soldiers escaping. During the battle, the French had displayed significantly improved tactical acumen by pinning the English down with infantry and artillery before striking them in the flank with heavy cavalry. The French quickly regained the rest of Normandy, as there is now very little left to oppose them. To the south, in 1451, the French turned their attention to the province of Gascony, which, despite its relative distance from the British Isles, had very strong ties with England, in part because it had been under English control since the 12th century, whereas Normandy had only been English for a few decades. As they had done in Normandy, the French invaded in overwhelming strength, and by the end of 1451, every major English garrison in Gascony had been captured or surrendered. The English were now left with Calais, as their only continental holding. Despite this, there was still significant pro-English sentiment in the region, as many of its leading citizens preferred less direct rule from England to the more centralizing French control, and in 1452, a plan was hatched to bring the English back. Sir John Talbot, a veteran chevalier who had previously taken part in many battles and had even been captured by the French, arrived with a few thousand strong force, and at least initially, was positively received by the local population, quickly recapturing Bordeaux and many other strongholds in the duchy. Talbot then consolidated his position, and received a number of reinforcements under the command of his son, 
Viscount Lyle. Enraged by the sudden loss of Goscony, which he perceived as being due to treachery, Charles VII set about organizing an expedition to restore French control. As they had done in Normandy, the French invaded from multiple directions to throw the defenders off balance, with armies attacking from the east, north, and southeast. Talbot's best chance was to defeat each French force in Goscony separately, before they could gather an overwhelming strength. First, he marched to relieve the besieged town of Castillon. The French had set up camp not far from the town, with the bulk of their troops inside the fortified artillery park. Several hundred to a thousand archers to the west garrisoned the St. Florent Priory, and around 1,000 Breton mounted men at arms in the hills to the north. Although the French army was commanded by committee, it is likely that Jean Bureau, who had played a great role in the development of a powerful artillery train for the French king, was in a position of prominence. The battle began as Talbot's vanguard emerged from the woods, taking the French garrison in the Priory by surprise, as they had likely only posted lookouts to watch the main road, and were thus not ready for an attack from this direction. After a short combat, the French infantry archers were routed by Talbot's men-at-arms, and the survivors fled back to their camp. Talbot's men celebrated their victory while the foot soldiers arrived, and some anglo Gascon men-at-arms performed a reconnoiter near the French position. A small skirmish broke out, in which the French commander was knocked off his horse, but was otherwise indecisive. Some observers within Castillon then reported seeing a cloud of dust near the French camp, suggesting that a large body of men and animals were on the move. Talbot assumed this meant that a French withdrawal was in the process of occurring, and gathered his vanguard to press home the attack, even though the rest of his army had not yet fully formed up. Although pushing ahead with just a small force might seem foolish, by doing so, Talbot likely hoped that striking the French army in the rear while it was in the middle of a retreat would cause it to collapse and rout. As Talbot's men neared the enemy camp, it must have dawned on them that the French were not in fact in the middle of withdrawing, but resolutely manning the earth and wooden defenses of their camp, supported by numerous artillery pieces. The supposed retreat had never in fact taken place. What the English observers had actually seen was just servants leading extra horses and pack animals out of the camp to make room for the fleeing archers. It was too late to turn back now though, and Talbot ordered his men to dismount and attack. Despite fighting valiantly, the isolated English vanguard suffered heavy casualties to French gunfire and were unable to break through. As the battle continued to rage, some more English and Gascon troops, mostly infantry, arrived piecemeal to join Talbot, but were still stopped by the French defenders at the Ditch and Stockade. As Talbot's soldiers exhausted themselves, the battle seemed to have reached a stalemate, with the French confined to their camp, but the English attack having stalled out. At that point, however, the Breton cavalry rode back from the hills to attack the English from the flank. Soon, the entire exhausted English line was rolled up, and in the process of collapsing. As what remained of his force recoiled in distress, Talbot attempted to valley them, but was pinned under his horse when it was killed. Unceremoniously, a French infantryman likely finished off the English general with an axe blow to the head. Meanwhile, Talbot's son Lyle was also killed. With their commanders dead, the anglo goscon army completely disintegrated. In the aftermath, the rest of Goscony fell quickly to French forces. Although the war did not come to an immediate end following this dramatic English defeat, the English lost any realistic chance of regaining significant territories in France, losing Goscony now in addition to Normandy. In the following decades, England would fall into the calamitous dynastic squabble known as the War of the Roses, while France would continue in its ascent as a major European power, eventually directing its military might southward to claim the riches of the Italian peninsula, though that 
is a story for another time. Although it is always risky to draw overarching conclusions from a single battle, Castillon arguably shows that the French had learned their lessons from the earlier phases of the war. This is because the battle essentially played out like many of the previous battles, such as Cressy, Poitiers, Agincourt, and Vernouy, only with the parts reversed. As the French had done many times before, the English under Talbot launched a hasty attack without proper reconnaissance or full support right into a prepared enemy position, and paid for it with their lives. Thus, although for the most part individual battles should not be examined in isolation without their proper context, Castillon really should be as well known as Cressy or Agincourt. Thank you very much for watching. I plan on making many more videos about historical conflicts in the future, so if you like this, please consider subscribing. Once again, thank you.